Welcome to Detoxicity. This is a podcast in which I try to change the narrative around masculinity a little bit and allow some progressive voices and some interesting voices, diverse voices, to come into the picture. My name is Mike Joseph. I host and produce this show, and I thank you very, very much for listening and for supporting from the bottom of my heart. It means a lot. Now, if you enjoy this podcast, I hope that you are subscribing to it. If you aren't, please press the subscribe button on wherever it is you're listening to it, and uh, that way you'll get episodes on demand when they come, uh, which is usually on Wednesday mornings. I also certainly ask that you uh, spread the word. Uh, Please rate the podcast on whatever platform you're using to listen. Um, Make sure you leave a comment if you have something nice to say or if you have something constructive to say. It doesn't all have to be nice. And by all means, tell your friends, tell anyone who you think might get some creative juice or inspirational juice or just uh, would you'd like to listen to this please spread the word uh, however you can i am on social media if you would like to follow me i am on instagram at detox pod guy uh, my twitter is on hiatus for a little bit it will come back but it is tis mike joseph feel free to follow me on either of those platforms there is also facebook.com slash detoxicity and if you have a comment you can email me detoxpod at gmail.com I am always on the lookout for new guests, so if you know somebody who you think has an interesting story to tell or something to add to the overall conversation around detoxifying masculinity, please reach out to me via any of those platforms, and certainly if you yourself would like to be a part of this podcast, please reach out, let me know. Once again, I thank you for listening. So, anonymity is a thing that has not yet really come up on this podcast. We've done 90 episodes, this is number 90. And everyone that I've spoken to has used, almost everyone that I've spoken to has used their real name. And in this case, uh, the person that I'm speaking to is not using their full name. So I'm going to be respectful of that and, of course, am respectful of any guest that chooses some sort of anonymity uh, because things are real out there and some people potentially face consequences for living in their truth. And look. I don't use my full real name on this podcast either, so I get it is what I'm saying. Anyway, uh, Josh is based in the Rhode Island area, Providence area. Uh, He goes by the White Heart, and uh, that has to do, I believe, with his work in Freemasonry, uh, which is something that I didn't know a whole lot about aside from when people talk about Jay-Z being a Freemason and like the Mark of the Beast and all that other bullshit, but... One thing Josh does during this podcast is give us a breakdown on what being a Freemason is really all about. Um, We also talk about his multiple attempts at a college degree. Uh, We talk about his now eight-year marriage with a wonderful, wonderful person and what he's learned uh, about relationships, about his own sexuality, and about life in general. So uh, sit back, relax, and have a listen to what Josh has to say. Hey everyone, I'm Josh, also known as Whiteheart Josh to quite a few people now, so that's what I'll go by. I am a partner and husband. I am an emergency manager, uh, former EMT. I am a Freemason and recently starting to come out as something other than straight. That's a whole bunch of things to discuss. That is a small number of things that I do. (laughs) (laughs) I am curious. I I know nothing about Freemasonry, so I think I want to start there just because I need you to educate me on what that is and what it's about. Sure, absolutely. Uh, And I'm happy to do it. Most people would associate Freemasons with a lot of older white men, and it is by its nature. It is a fraternity. What we would consider a regular Freemasonry does not allow women to join, which has brought up many a great debate in my house with my wife. But it's also interesting that we keep it that way, uh, and I can get into more about that later. And so many people don't understand a lot about it because the older mentality was such that, you know, it's a fraternity of secrets. And so they would go out, they would do their meetings, they wouldn't talk to anybody about them. They wouldn't share what they did as a fraternity and understand that I'll probably use one of your buzzwords for your, for your podcast here. It's, it's a very toxic thing to do to, to keep uh, secrets, especially when you don't have to. There are many things within Freemasonry that we can openly talk about. We can talk about some of the things uh, that we uh, would consider moral lessons, some of the symbols that we use and identify ourselves to the public, and also that we use 
to kind of uh, keep ourselves on the right. Really, the only things we can't do are, are tell you about the secrets that we that we swore to each other that we wouldn't reveal. But it's not a a secret society. We don't deny our existence. You know, we put the square encompasses that many people associate with Freemasonry on the outside of our buildings. My particular lodge has a giant blue sign out in front of it that tells you who we are, what our name is, when we meet, and it even has the master of the lodge's name underneath it, which for those who are unaware, it would be equivalent to the president of another type of organization. So mm-hmm. he, he, he runs the lodge. I'm glad that it is less of a secret society than I imagined it was, because I don't want to wake up tomorrow morning with a horse's head in my bed or anything like that. That would be (laughs) just by virtue of doing this interview. Is there an actual agenda? Like, does it exist just as a social fraternity type thing? So what your listeners can't see is me just kind of like laughing here in the background. Yeah. Uh, course. So contrary to the many Dan Brown novels and and movies that exist, uh, there is no new world order agenda. Our treasure is not buried under the floor of our temple. There's a lot of times where we can barely, you know, get our own shit together, much less take over the world. And when people bring those types of conspiracies up, it is so easy to find them online. But what people don't see are a lot of the good things that the Freemasons do and have done, I will say first and foremost, our agenda, if we were to have one at all, is basically self-improvement. One of the tropes that is used quite often is making good men better. Good men will always find a way to make themselves better. We simply provide an outlet for men to come together from different backgrounds, share their experiences, talk about what it is they want to improve, and, and work with each other to do that. And we have a lot of different symbols and moral lessons that we use, and it's it's highly allegorical in nature. Most people who would listen to it or find it online, if they were so inclined, can read a bit. It won't be entirely accurate, but they'll look at it and be like, wow, this is really weird. It's, it's written in a lot of old English. It's tough to understand, but those of us that have been initiated get it, and it is not a fraternity that... Everybody can join. Not everybody who applies gets accepted. And, you know, we've had our own divisions over time over years. So that's why I say we can't take over the world if we can't get our own shit together. So there's obviously the what we consider mainstream Freemasonry, what most people see, you know, (laughs) older white guys walking around with aprons and, you know, wearing gloves and wearing tuxedos and going to these meetings or hanging out in groups. But there's also another faction of it as well. There is another group of Freemasons called Prince Hall Freemasons who are Black Freemasons. They started off as a lodge before Blacks in this country could do anything else. Actually started here in New England, even though those lodges still exist with, you know, desegregation and everything else. They still, like many historically Black groups, still exist. They still meet. They are independent of a state Grand Lodge. So in the United States, each state has its own Grand Lodge. We operate under their authority. Prince Hall Masons, where they do exist in this country, have their own separate and distinct Grand Lodge. And we recognize that they are still our, our brothers and we visit each other. You know, we'll still break bread and and share everything else we would as Masons. There's no difference. We just. Very cool. Keep that distinction. Yeah. So self self self-improvement seems like it's something that's super important to you. And has that always been the case? How did that come into play for you? Um, I don't want to say it was always been a priority for me. I think it became more of a priority as I got towards the later end of my teenage years. So I I grew up in a predominantly female household. I'm from the great and mighty state of Rhode Island. For those (laughs) looking for it on a map, first grab a New England specific map because a United States map will be too large. Then grab a magnifying glass. Rhode Island uh, is a dot, y'all. And you will find it. I actually moved to Rhode Island with my family when I was very young and have primarily lived here ever since. Okay. And as a teenager, because I'm thinking back to when I was a kid and the concept of self-improvement for me just didn't exist. Like I wouldn't have, someone would have been like, yeah, self-improvement. I've been like, what the fuck is that? Was, yeah, I'm just trying to figure out like, when did it sort of present itself as such? I would say just before I moved out of the house to go to college. So as I was saying, you know, I I grew up in a predominantly female household. And and what I'm about to say next is going to sound like I'm like shitting on my father, but I love the man to death. But he did not provide for me what I would have assumed would have been the traditional like male upbringing. You know, so I didn't have 
I didn't have brothers that would, you know, to pick on me or for me to pick on them. My parents never really got me involved in sports, even if I kind of expressed an interest. So here I was going off to college with just a in my opinion, a very narrow view of what my world was. And I didn't have many friends growing up. I'm kind of kept to myself. I still tend to do that, but I am branching out a bit more. So when I went off to college, it was like, okay, what am I supposed to be doing with myself? So for me, th that self-improvement wasn't just, you know, what do I need to do to be a man, but what do I need to do for myself to live in this world? You know, I think we do a very poor job. I mean, I, I still work in higher education. Well, I I've always worked in higher education. So I, I see students come in that have a, like me, have a very narrow view of the world. And so it was important for me to kind of expand my, my look outside of the small state of Rhode Island and understand where do I fit into it? How do I learn the things that I didn't have the opportunity to, opportunity to do when I was younger? And not to completely sidetrack, but you did bring up higher education and at least alluded to the fact that people come into college and maybe even leave college without a firm grasp on life skills. And do you think anything's being done to change that? I don't know many people in higher ed. I don't have much higher ed experience myself. I think the answer is no, but I'm curious what someone who's closer to it things. It's tough to say. So my job in higher education is is an emergency management. So so my job is to unfortunately do all the hard planning that goes around active shooters, around severe weather. My wife calls me sometimes the master of disaster. <laughs> so I'm not really student facing other than when I do educational talks on how to be better prepared for all the stuff that's out there that's going to really mess up your day. Right. Um and so I don't do a lot of follow up with them after to see if they've taken that after they've left the school. I don't really have a mechanism to do that. But also, I think the higher education in general takes on the role of a surrogate parent, if you will. Let's use COVID as the example. You know, at least at my school, we took on that role of, okay, if you get sick, we're going to take care of you. We're going to make sure that you have the proper isolation or quarantine. We're going to make sure that you're fed, you know, not that we wouldn't anyway. But we go that extra step. We, we're delivering it to their door for them. We're making sure they have cleaning supplies. We're making sure they're getting tested. We were making sure that they were getting vaccinated. We were providing those clinics. So I think you almost exchange one for the other. You leave that, that safety net of your parents, and we create a new one for you. Of course, you do have the flexibility if you want to, you know, go out somewhere, party, drink too heavily, whatever it is. Right. Um, and there are consequences to those. But again, I think it's also a sheltered consequence. You drink too hard on campus, you know, pass out and the public safety department or, or security police, whoever they are, pick you up, drag you back to your room or to the ER. You know, you get sanctioned. It, it's a slap on the wrist. If you and I did that, we'd be in a holding cell for 24 hours till we detox. And then yeah, we'd be in front correct. of the judge trying to explain everything and pay a fine or worse. Right. So, yeah, so there are still consequences, but but they're shelter. It's a sheltered consequence. So if we want to view higher education as that that step into, you know, the real world into adulthood, we're doing a really poor job of it. But we need to be starting sooner. I mean, I I've been through college twice now. I failed miserably the first time and pulled myself back up, got back into it and succeeded the second time go around. But I I, I don't fault anybody but myself for that. But maybe I could fault the K through 12 system a little bit, especially high school for not saying, hey, you know, in, instead of taking calculus in high school, maybe you should learn how to balance a checkbook. Maybe you should learn how to do what any one of the hundred tasks I have to do as, as an adult, as a husband, as a partner. I've kind of learned a lot of that as I go and made a lot of mistakes. Yeah. And, and, and it, they're big mistakes too sometimes, you know, financially, you can get yourself in a lot of trouble. You don't understand credit card is cool. The bill comes due. Who does it ever? Yep. And that bill has to be paid. <laughs> yeah. You can't, if you don't pay it, there will be severe consequences down the line. As someone who has had severe debt over the course of, of his life, I can, certainly if there's anybody out there listening who does not think that they will come for you, they will, they will get their money by hook or by crook. So why was it that the, the first attempt at college didn't succeed for you? It was a mix of two things. One, I excelled really easily in, in high school. And I don't know why I just, I could just do it. When I got to college, I kind of took the same route, like, oh, this is going to be easy and kind of got in a little bit over my head in that regard, maybe picked the wrong major to start with. It was 
kind of outside of my wheelhouse and uh, also trying to support myself financially through college mm-hmm. um, be- became the priority work. A lot of people have to work to get through college and mm-hmm. you know, that's, that's unfortunate, but it ended up becoming the priority for me was to work. So, you know, both things just kind of came to a head at one point and I, and I was essentially forced to drop out. I appreciate people who had the wherewithal to go to school full-time and work full-time. That takes a level of commitment, maybe a lack of sleep, whatever it is. But I, I, <laughs> I, I, I was not one of those people. And I take my hat off to anybody who is capable of doing that. That's kind of beyond my reach to, to be able to handle both those things at the same time. But you made it through. And now you're gainfully employed and you're a college graduate and you've got, you know, all this stuff behind you. What do you think the experience of going through that a second time, what do you think it taught you? Or what was the biggest lesson you learned through all of that? That's a really good question. I don't know. Uh, One minute, it looks like you're not prepared to <laughs> When you go through the first time, you, you know, you start off like 18-ish or something like that. You, you graduated at 22, you're ready to conquer the world. I went back the second time when I was 30. And so, you know, I don't want to say quite a bit older than, than everybody else that's there, but old enough that everyone notices that you're older than them. Right. So I, I think one of the things... So instead of learning something, I, I think I took it upon myself with a couple of classmates. They kind of almost act like a mentor role. Like, listen, you know, I know you want to go do this, this other thing, which sounds really fun. And you can do that, but you're going to miss this study session. You're going to miss reading on this topic to be ready for the next exam. There'll be plenty of other times to go out and party, but do this right the first time. You won't, you won't look like me sitting in the back of the classroom. I would go from work to the classroom. There were sometimes I was coming to class in a full suit and the heads turn as you walk in thinking you're right. the professor. Like, right. So I ended up going through actually finishing in community college. It, one, it saved me a bunch of money. Two, it, it, you know, it fit my schedule because you have to go at night at that point. So I, I don't know that I really learned any valuable lesson that I hadn't already learned by, by, putting, by delaying trying a second time. Going back to what you said about being a mentor to some of the younger people in your classes, is that a role that you fit into regularly? I find the second you take on that mantle, you set up an unrealistic expectation of yourself. So I like to teach others. I, I do it quite frequently in, in the Masons and with a few other things that I do. But the second I think that I have my hands around everything, somebody throws me a curveball question that I can't answer. And it really puts me back on my heels and it's like, you know what? I don't know everything. So while I like to do that stuff, I wouldn't consider myself one. Okay. All right. And it also sounds like you are very much still invested in the process of learning about yourself or coming to new conclusions as, as you alluded to during your intro, where you have sort of come to the conclusion that you are maybe not as straight as you thought you were. So I don't think I've always been completely straight, but it was how I identified. So my wife and I have been married now eight years. We've known each other almost 10 now. When we first got together, one day she's just like, hey, do you want to try this thing? Yeah, I'll try the thing, whatever this thing is. Turns out it was different forms of it. And so, you know, we, within our friend circle, most of us know we, we dabble in that. I don't think they know how, how involved we are with it. Um, and that's okay. Not, not everybody has to know everything. Right, exactly. But we've always maintained a very healthy line of communication with each other about what we like, what we dislike, the people we like and the people that we dislike. And so there was a period of time where we were talking about some different things within that community and, and other types of lifestyles. And it was just like, okay, you know, so if I happen to see this going on, it, it doesn't bother me. You know, if you go to a club, you see two guys making out, not a big deal to me. Never, never has been, Which, you know, my, my thought. Cut no, you off. Ahead. Yeah. One thing that I've never really understood, people who are most vociferously against it, I, I, I don't know if this is just me projecting or, or what it is, people who are most vociferously against it ultimately always feel like the people who are most interested in it because if you're not interested in it you just kind of like shrug your shoulders and you're like they're doing what they're doing and that's cool with them i find the people who are opposed to two men kissing are the ones that are the cheerleaders for two ladies doing it ha that's probably true as well and, and that one has always baffled me because if you're okay with homosexuality in one gender or or other genders why are you not okay with it for another I I think there's two things at play here. I think one, 
is that men, American men, have largely been conditioned to believe that when two women are sexually interested in one another, it's a play for them, right? Like they're an active participant in whatever that is, whether that's the reality or not. So there's the sense that two women making out is titill- it is titillating for straight men. The other thing I think is kind of a latency, man. I think there's intrigue in seeing two men kissing and by being so loudly against it, they're punishing themselves for their interest. I can see that. Yeah. But that's just, I mean, that's my thought. Yeah. I, 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 I don't mean, know the reality. I mean, the only other thought that I had is if you identify as a straight man, you see two women kissing, you you log that as that's your fantasy, right? right. I mean, a stereotype, right? And you can insert yourself into that fantasy. So you don't have that, that repulsion from it. But if you t- see two guys kissing, for you in your brain, there's nowhere for you to insert yourself into that, into that scenario. I mean, I'm just as guilty as the next person of fantasizing about things. But if I see two guys kissing and it doesn't turn me on, then it's not like, oh, you know, you can't do that or you shouldn't do that. It's like, you know what? Good for you. Right. Like this is, a, it's I, not for I, me, I hope, but I'm, I'm glad you're happy. Absolutely. 100% Absolutely. glad you're happy. Absolutely. You know, and so, so for me, you know, it never had an issue with that. So we were recently on a trip. I'm measuring my words carefully because uh, one part of my lifestyle, we're not out to everybody on. So we were recently on a trip and it was very refreshing to see the different types of people and bodies that were there and interacting and not always in a sexual way, just sometimes in a caring, loving, platonic way. And that was that was nice because I have never been in such an area where that was the norm sure. as opposed to the exception. And believe it or not, that's kind of on that trip where I kind of had this, this thought where, you know, I've always identified as straight because that was the easiest way to identify who I was and what I might be interested in. And I think by about the third day or so, I happened to look at my wife and I was like, hey, that person over there is really, really attractive. And she's like, oh, that's interesting that you say that. And I'm like, that's really interesting that I hear myself say that. This was this was someone who was a trans female. And so that previously would not really have crossed my mind to think of myself being with somebody like that. When I say like it intrigued me, it just sounds wrong. But I was it's, attracted to that person, not sure. and not necessarily for how you know they looked completely, but just because of the types of conversations we had. We had a very open conversation. Uh, and I did that with with several other people, including men, had very open, honest communication. And it was huge for me. So when I got home, I was like, listen, I don't see myself always being with or playing with men or with non-binary people or with or with trans folks. But there is a part of me, you know, that is attracted to them, whether that's through a, a, a demisexual type of connection or something else. And I'm completely comfortable with that. I it wasn't like a, you know, for me, like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm this. It was like, you know what? This is this feels comfortable for me. And I didn't want to sign a label to it because I've had a couple of friends ask, you know, oh, are you bi? Are you this? I'm like, no, I actually, the the most recent person I came out to is actually my realtor. How did that come up even in conversation? So our our realtor is really cool. So, so my wife and I work on another, my wife and I work on another podcast together. Mm -hmm. She's the host. I am the sound engineer. And he was on the podcast talking about the housing market and how he works within the housing market as a realtor being a trans man. And so um, when it came time for us, because we are in the process, well, we're not in the process of selling our home. Our home is sold. We're in the process of finding a place to go. You know, our first reach out was because we kind of built up even just that short connection with them. I was like, listen, we really want you as your realtor. You know, I think you understand what it is we're looking for, the type of area we want to be in. And so we've, we've gotten, uh, gotten to have a really good relationship with them. So we were out waiting for an open house or something, grabbing a coffee. And we were talking about some different things. And uh, every time he was talking about, you know, cis men and this and that, you know, he kept kind of like referring to me just kind of like it's because if you look at me, I'm, I am the epitome for everything against <laughs> maybe the, the LGBTQ community or, or anything else. And so I said, I, I got to tell you, I'm not straight. He's like, oh, well, then what are you? I said, I'm, I'm something other than straight. And he goes, and that is, <laughs> and I don't have a label for it. It's just something other than straight. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think, I think you, and maybe this is just uh, something that's easy to identify, you might be the mirror image of me in, in some ways, or at least in that way. Okay. Where it's like, I, 
it's I've identified as different things over the course of my life. I, I do not feel comfortable with with bi. I don't feel comfortable with gay, but there's somewhere in that spectrum in which I exist. And sometimes I, it's it's really hard to it's hard to quantify, to put a, a name on it, to put words on it. So it just is. I, I and to go into a long drawn out explanation like, yeah, well, I'm uh, homo romantic, but not always. I, yeah, it's just it's complicated. Maybe that's the word <laughs> I should start using. Complicated I, is is it complicated or it's do complicated we make it for other complicated. people? It's yes, compl- it's not complicated for me. I know what I am, and I'm very cool with it. But when I have to explain it to other people, because people want to put you in a box, it's even like when I'm trying to explain my you know my ethnic background. Black is easy, but there's other different, you know, whether it's me being Afro-Latino or there are many different other factors being from the Caribbean or my family being from the Caribbean, like all this other stuff that fits into uh, my ethnic makeup. So while it's easy to use one word or two words so people can just put you in a box and be done with the, and you can be done with the conversation, that's Mm -hmm. generally not the reality of the situation. I don't, I, at least I don't think it is. It's not for me, it doesn't appear to be for you. I think if you really broke it down for most people, there's a lot more nuance to uh, a binary explanation of who you are, what you are. Yeah, I mean, the, the reason why I like just saying, you know, I'm, I'm something other than straight is because it allows me the flexibility to explore and just, and just be me without, you know, I know some people, and, and I don't want to, seem like this is this is a negative stereotype because it's certainly not but there are some people who who hang their hat on that particular identity that is that is who they are and that is that is their entire being and if you were to take that away from them they they lose that sense of of identity they lose that sense of community and that can be hard for a lot of people right. um so i get why it is so important for some folks to, to quickly label something, even if it changes, you know, down the road, they, they find something else. You know, I, I've had this talk many times with, with people who are, who would consider themselves to be bisexual. However, they are attracted to more than just the two different genders. You know, they're okay with trans, they're okay with, with non-binary. And so I go, okay, so then are you, are you pansexual? And they go, maybe, but when I was growing up, this was the language, this was yes. the terminology we had yes. then. Yes. And so this is what I most comfortably identify with. So this is what I'm sticking with. But if I happen to play around with someone who's non-binary, who's whatever, then so be it. But they're going to say that they're bisexual and not pan. And that's okay. There, there's been a lot of language that's developed over the past decade and a half or so that gives people way more options. But if, if you're somebody like me, there was black, white, or Latin or Asian, and there was straight, gay, bisexual. And, you know, I I definitely know people who are a little older. I've had this conversation with my folks before who think there's no such thing as a bisexual person. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And that bisexual people are just gays in training. I've heard that many, many times. Yep. It's it's the gateway. uh, It's the gateway. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And it's like, no, I mean, and, you know, it took me a, a while to kind of really come to terms with the fact that there that there is a spectrum and that there are people all over the spectrum. I think part of it is a lot of people don't really know how to explain it or are not necessarily comfortable with it themselves. So that makes it hard to impart that to other folks. Yeah. And I also feel too, at least in some of the circles that we're in, you know, the second you identify as, you know, um, someone who's not just a, a straight man, you know, the, the other side of that is, you know, the, the other guy on the other end of that is like, oh, well, then, you know, I don't, I don't want any part of this because, you know, you might be looking at me or, you know, I'm not, it's like, that's great. Cause I'm not sexually attracted to you either. You know? right. <laughs> You're just, you know, so they, they, you know, you get that pushback there from that. I mean, at least I know, I haven't seen it too much, at least in the BDSM community where it's like, okay, you know, if you're, so I'll, I'll service top some people, you know, you want a spanking, you want a flogging, you want to try rope bondage, whatever it is. I happily provide that with no expectation that there's a sexual component to it, you know, whether it's, you know, a penetration or, or something else. I'll just do it because I like to do it and you like to receive it. So here we go. And what I like about it is it doesn't matter what, what my orientation is and what yours is. It's just, you just happen to like it. So sure. let's get it done. 
do people read into that though no if you're flogging somebody are they going do they not because i don't know much about uh, bdsm do they not read into that that there is a component of sexual attraction? I think that's going to depend on who's playing. And I, and I don't want to say like, I'm like even close to being an expert in this type of thing. I will say that that for me, so if I am playing with, with my partner and we're doing a flogging scene, there may be a sexual component involved. Not not always, but but more often than not, there will be one. Sure. But if somebody else comes to me and says, hey, you know, I heard you like to do this or that you're you're proficient at it and I'd like to experience it or I'd like to do a scene with you, we will go through the whole negotiation process. And if it's like for the next 30 minutes, I just want you to flog my back or whatever. And then we'll do the aftercare and then see you later. We'll check in in a couple of days, see how everything is. That's fine as a top or even as a service top. I don't have to, it's not implied that I'm going to get sexually excited about doing it. There are many times with someone who I'm not sexually partnered with that I don't, I just don't. I just, and I'm not necessarily either a, a sadist either. I just like providing the service. You're, you're a helpful guy. I try to be. <laughs> <laughs> it's not always easy, you know, because it, it, cause, well, you know, cause the other side of that is someone's like, oh, well, you know, he's a little too helpful or what is he getting out of, out of it, right? Sure. There's always, you know, let's, if we go full circle all the way back, right? What's the agenda? Sometimes there isn't one. Sometimes you just want to help somebody out so they can experience what that community is all about. Right. And, and break down that wall or that stigma or the, what, whatever false idea someone might have. Now, don't get me wrong. There are plenty of people who fit right into the stereotype and ruin it for everybody else. So we just do my best to fight against that. Right on. How does this stuff play into how you feel about your body? I, one thing that I feel like I, I have not <clears throat> discussed with enough people or that enough people haven't brought to the, the table on this podcast specifically is body image and how that can affect guys either in part of as part of the growing up process or as an adult or both but in some of these situations I would imagine that your body is on display in some way shape or form and you have to have a certain comfort level to allow yourself to be on display in this fashion most of the people that I know that are either showing parts of their body or wearing something that you might not consider mainstream, even though they may look comfortable, there's still a part of them, I think, that is still working through whatever barrier it is that they have of doing that. So I, I think you and I talked maybe even briefly about body image stuff. Most people, I think if they look at me, they'll be like, what do you have to worry about? I am a for all, you know, everything else, a pretty healthy looking guy. But, you know, when I, when I graduated high school, I think I, I might've weighed a hundred pounds. So my father used to joke that I used to have to run around in the shower to get wet. What was the other one he used to say? Oh, if I, if I stood to the side and stuck up my tongue, I'd look like a zipper. Wow. Yeah. I mean, he said it all in good fun. Sure. Um, but even then coming out of that, you know, I was, I was a long distance runner. So that, that wasn't an uncommon image to see in runners like me yeah, but it's a part of it bugged me because I was I always felt like I was such a small guy and so you know I wanted to bulk up and have muscle and do this and do that you know that was that in my head that was how you got the girl especially in college that's how you got to sleep with all the women right um so for me it was it was tough because I no matter what I did I I couldn't pack on weight well, until I saw until I started drinking beer, then it came real easy. I couldn't pack on muscle you know I, I wasn't getting any taller and uh, I'm a Puerto Rican Italian man I got hair everywhere so it's like what do i do with that thank you yeah yeah. this is uh this is this is all straight razor shaving you want to talk about doing something manly pick up a straight razor and learn how to use that i'm good thanks (laughs) so those are all things that i that i couldn't do easily and so what i just started doing was again that self-improvement thing what do I have to do to feel comfortable? And you know, I don't think there's one solution for every guy out there or for every person. I just think you have to own what it is that you've got. And I think it's more of a mindset too. It's very easy to put yourself in that mental loop of, you know, like I'm not good enough. I don't look well enough. I need to do this. I need to lose these five pounds. I need to whatever else. And then you keep feeding yourself that information. And no matter what anybody else ever says, you're still never good enough. And it's it's tough that the you know, our different types of media just keep hammering that on us as well, especially with, with so many of these different things that have these algorithms that, you know, within a couple of views, you know, they've got you pegged yeah. um, and they'll, and they'll keep sending you that same type of video, the same type of person. So every once in a while, I, whether it is hacking the system or not, but it puts my mind at ease every once in a while, I'll like something I normally don't. 
just to throw it out there, just to get something different and see if it breaks the cycle, breaks the wheel. Sometimes it works, even like on Facebook. I wrote a paper once about, it was about radicalism and about the echo chambers within extremist groups, how they get more folks in and how they just radicalize everybody and they build up that echo chamber. And I linked it right back to social media because it's the same thing. It is very easy for us to, to put up these walls against everything that sounds wrong to us and block it all, block out what we consider all the noise and only focus on this one particular message. And again, the algorithm will keep sending you. You go down that rabbit hole on YouTube, you know, you click on one thing and the next thing you're five videos away from something else and you're like, where did this come from? Yeah. The algorithm said you might enjoy this. Yeah. And here we are. So I, I always tell people, don't just always get rid of or thumb down or report or whatever it is, some of these other articles, just to kind of keep yourself in check every once in a while. Now, I'm, I mean, there's obviously some things that I'm not going to read, but I don't just dismiss them either because I, I want to hear everything. I want to be able to make my own informed opinion or decision and that means that I have to be willing to listen to both sides, not just worrying about, you know, what is it that really gains my attention. That makes sense. I, it's really interesting that you mention the social media algorithms and how they sort of train you, or um, I guess you kind of train yourself in a way, but the, you and the platform are sort of working in concert to narrow cast you into this very specific bubble. And I don't know if I think about that very often. Yeah, I mean, I wrote the paper and, and realized what, what some extremist groups were using to, re to recruit members. I and mean, that's, that's kind of where it opened it up for me. And I was like, oh, I never thought about that. Right, <laughs> right. Um, but if we're gonna link it back, you know, back to, to body image and, and body positivity, instead of going down this weird extremist yes. uh, trail, we might find ourselves down. I find myself doing things that I normally wouldn't think of doing just to see how it makes me feel. You know, on our vacation that my wife and I took, I started wearing uh, eyeliner on that trip. Someone's like, hey, you know, some celebrities do it. Why don't you give it a shot? Okay, I'll, I'll give it a go. Um, I got to tell you what, it, it, it took me about two weeks and I love this stuff. I wore some out the other night, you know, and not many people actually notice it because they don't know what it is they're looking for. Right. Um, they just know something, something's a little different, but that doesn't mean I want to be a female. It doesn't mean that I want to transition to become a woman. It doesn't mean that I'm gay. Uh, it just means that I like how I look in this particular style. I'm still going to come home and mow the lawn and rake the leaves and chop the firewood, work on the car, work on the truck, go camping, you know, drink beer, do all that other manly stuff. You just go do that shit with eyeliner. But if I want to also look good when I go out, why can't I? Why can't you? I... It's something I struggle with as, as well and have been trying to figure out recently. Like I've started painting my toenails because I have gross ass man feet. <laughs> and, you know, I'm also diabetic, so I have to be careful about, about my feet. And I had a pedicure for the first time over the summer. And I was like, like, I just want to like touch my feet like it's soft i have like baby feet and they're pretty and the nails are even this is fucking great why didn't i do this 20 years ago but i have been socialized in a way where even though i identify as queer there are things that i have not done in my life things that i would not wear colors that i would not wear because they were seen as too feminine so Breaking out of that method of thinking, even again, as a person who has sucked many a dick in his life, it's very prevalent in my head still. And I'm still kind of like looking at my toes and like, eh, you know, this looks cool, but what, what will other people think? So I also paint my toenails. Okay. Um, I got my first pedicure a couple of years ago after a little bit of prodding from my wife. And she's like, well, why don't we just go? It was also that same social conditioning. You know, like men don't, you know, go to get their feet scrubbed and whatever else. And tell you, um, you should. It, yes. it feels great. Dude. You don't have, when you go for a pedicure, by the way, you don't have to. And, and I'm, I'm saying this to you because it's just you and I talking. But for, right. for everyone that's listening, when you go for a pedicure, you don't have to get your toenails painted. No. Nope. You can just go have them. I mean, the place we go is fantastic. You know, you get the bath, you get the massage and they'll massage, they massage all the way up to my calves and they, it, you're right. They feel soft. They feel great. If you're one of those guys who are like manly men and they don't do this and you're wondering why you can't get the girl, 
go get a pedicure done and they'll want to you know touch your legs feel how smooth it is right you know? <laughs> it, it feels good so i got my first mani ahead of that trip and got my nails painted as well never had my fingernails painted before and we've been on that trip. I, I met four or five other guys that all had their fingernails painted. Now I went with a very, with like a, with like a battleship gray. They were wearing gold glitter, blue. I'm like, this, this is, this is great. Right. Um, and, and not once would I ever questioned whether they were a man enough or not. A hundred percent. If they identified as a man, they were a man. Yeah. Ultimately that's what it is. And I say this objectively, even though I still am working my way through the subjectivity of it. But it doesn't like wear a dress, paint your nails, whatever it is that you want to do. It's a free world and your aesthetic, the way that you look has no definitive, you know, it doesn't definitively call out your gender or your gender expression or your sexuality or whatever it is. And people shouldn't think it does. There's a whole re-education piece that uh, has to happen for a lot of folks. And, you know, I'm, I'm in that group as well. Yeah. There are still things that I learn every day. Like I'll, I'll, I'll say something and my wife would be like, Hey, you know, you should reconsider that. <laughs> du duly noted. And, and, I, and I'll go and I'll read up on something or talk to a couple other people and, and get my stuff sorted out. I always thought that there were two, two trains of, of, of folks here. You know, they're, they're the older people and it's just like, you know, they're, they're kind of a write-off. They're going to say and do what they want and they can get away with it because they're old and they're never going to change. My thinking on that has changed a, a bit. I hear them talk. I hear what they have to say, but then I offer them a different opinion. Right. It's like, listen, I, I, I get that these are the terms that you use because for me, the biggest thing that I never had at my disposal was language. So as I learn new things, <clears throat> discover new terms or whatever it is that's out there, when I hear uh, somebody who's, who's older say something, you know, uh, maybe a derogatory term or something, it's like, listen, you may have said that 30 years ago, 20 years ago, it's not right. And, not here's, why it, and here's why it's not. Right. And then on the other side of that, there's a younger group of people who are coming up that are fighting really hard for their identity, their existence. And I wondered where I am in the middle of that. Not quite young, not quite old, not middle aged, just kind of in that in that space. And I realized that it's it's both, you know, because I'll say something that isn't right, and someone will correct me. And good, I'm I'm glad I learned that lesson. But also, I feel like I need to be there when I when when I'm asked, and and I'll clarify that in a minute. When I'm asked um, to provide that support, you know, to to be there and do that and advocate. The reason why I say ask is so for many years I identified myself as an ally before I started saying I'm something other than straight. Mm -hmm. And very quickly realized that, you know, the last thing any community needs from me is for me to open my, and, and I say that in the nicest way possible to myself because, because I'm a white guy. So I learned very quickly that what, what I think at least the communities that I'm involved in need me to do is to shut my mouth, be an ear when they need to vent, need to talk about something. And then if they need support, offer it using their words, not my own and, and kind of basically be that microphone, you know, that, that megaphone for them to push their message out to, to a larger group. Cause if, if it comes from their mouth, I'd rather use their wording than mine oh, yeah. um, be because they know what they need or, right. or what they want more, right. more than, more, more than, than I do. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I, I'm curious. You, in my eyes, you're not white. You are pale. You are light complected well but it's September here in Rhode Island so. that is true <laughs> right but if you're half Puerto Rican you're particularly for me as someone who is a New Yorker and grew up with tons of, of people who are Latinx and even like when I first met you I was like John is it he's got there's something there that's not Caucasian <laughs> <laughs> it's it's so, my wife that's who's <laughs> well that's true that's true so th that's funny that you mentioned that. So our house is, is a fun house. It's a very loud house because my wife, like you, is an Afro-Latina or she, she tends to use Latinx now. And so she, she came to Rhode Island from Puerto Rico. She is a Puerto Rican. She, she has the accent. She understands the culture, the language, the, everything else. I do not. I do not speak Spanish. I am half Puerto Rican on my biological father's side. Man, I do not know. Never grew up with the culture with the language, with anything that connected me to the island. 
So I've never identified as Hispanic or Puerto Rican, even though genetically speaking, I am. And for most people in America, that's tough to, to understand that because Americans would be the first ones to be like, I'm Italian, I'm this, I'm that. It's like, really? But, you know, it's it's five generations back and they don't know the language. They don't right. know the culture. So I, I find it hard to identify as anything other than uh, American. And sometimes even that's difficult to do because I have unpopular opinions, but that's neither here nor there. Unpopular within the framework well, of this probably, podcast. Probably not. <laughs> uh, so, so yes. So, so genetically speaking, I, I am half Puerto Rican. The other half of me is a mix of, you know, a Western European Italian, but I don't identify as any of those other than what I pass off as because that's how I grew up. Sure. I get that. Which Again, I, I, I would imagine Rhode Island and New York are different in that respect uh, because, again, like I pegged you immediately as not entirely white. Oh, you didn't. Yeah, I did. You didn't peg me at all. Well, that is true. <laughs> that is true. Maybe if you'd have asked. But yeah, as soon as I saw, I was like, this guy's not. But again, I've grown up in an environment where there's so much specificity within cultures, you can kind of call that out. Whereas certain parts of this country in the world, somebody who is a certain shade and has a certain kind of hair, like that's a white person, that's a black person without going into particular detail. Right. I mean, my, my mother-in-law had me identified the second she met me. She, she told my wife, oh, he definitely has the plantain stain. <laughs> so it's like, I'm in. I love that. I'm in, I'm good. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it sounds like your relationship, the relationship with your partner really sustains you and is really like a, a, a good relationship to be in. Like y'all, it seems like y'all challenge each other in the best ways. We, I, I talk a lot about her and I, and I know vice versa. We've, we've both, we both saved each other in, in different ways when we met. And so it's been the way we communicate with others is something that actually takes a lot of people off guard because they're not used to seeing people that open with each other. I love her to death. And I, and I hope, I hope she feels the same way about me. I'm pretty certain she does. There's, there's obviously a certain level of trust in, in a lot of the things that we do. And I, I think, you know, for her, you know, having someone who is willing to learn about her, not just her as a person, but her culture, her language, the way she identifies as a person and the types of people she wants to be with and, and not make any judgment or assumption is, is new for her. And, and I say new, like 10 years ago, it was new. Now it's, now it's old hat. And for me, someone who, who challenges me to be the best me, whether it's for her benefit or not, is, is something that was very new to me because we both have been taken advantage of in the past in some pretty bad ways. We've even talked about that together. Like, listen, this is, you know, it wasn't like, well, you know, a boyfriend back in the day hurt me and, you know, don't do that to me ever again. I was like, listen, an ex of mine hurt me. And this is exactly what she what did to me. And this is why I don't want you to do, you know, not do this, but this is why I don't want you to touch me here. This is why I don't like doing this when we're having sex. This is why, you know, if you want to explore this type of kink or fantasy, we can do that, but it's going to take time. You know, I don't. I, I wish more people, there, there are people who do that. I wish there were more. I that really wish there were more. Actually going to be my next question. Why, and this is maybe rhetorical. I don't know if you have any insight into this. Why aren't more relationships like that? Why I've been reading, so I've been reading All About Love by Bell Hooks. And there is a, a part in the book where she talks about radical honesty, which, <sighs> I don't know if I'm there yet in any of my relationships, but I try to present as truth forward as possible. Not to say that I don't fudge on occasion, but I, it's really important to me that the people that I'm closest to know what I'm about and know how I feel or how I feel about them as truthfully as I can present it at that moment. And it seems like game playing and bullshit is so prevalent in society and in relationships that when people are approached with anything resembling radical honesty, they're like, oh, fuck, I don't know what the hell to do. But I think that that's super important to cultivate and keep relationships that are real. So uh, how do more people figure this out? 
by hanging out with more people who are like them. <laughs> uh, but no, I mean, really, I mean, you know, I, in the past, I, I've had relationships where it feels more like keeping up with the Joneses than anything else. You know, you're with a girlfriend and you have your friend circle and they all start getting married. So you have to get married. Mm. If somebody adopts a dog. You all have to adopt a dog. If somebody, you know, has a baby. Everyone's got to have a baby. And that's, that's a really tough thing to keep up if that's not who you are. I think too, I think, I think the barrier there is that, you know, I think there's a certain level of fear that people have, whether you're a romantic, you're a schmoozer, you're whatever it is you are, right? You always present your best self, right? Maybe you exaggerate a little bit to get the person, right? Because we've, we've all been there, you know, <laughs> that only lasts for so long before that facade comes down, right? And what do you have left? So if you start that honest communication, when, when that veneer of the newness of the relationship breaks down, you don't have to worry about what's behind it. It was all out there. So for me, my wife and I met long after all of our friends had decided we're having babies, we're getting married, we're getting the house with the, with the picket fence and the two and a half kids. You know, we always question which half of the kid did you get? Is it, you know, we, we want to know where that half kid is. How do you, how do you draw the line? So we met after most of our friends had done that. And so for us, it was like, a, you know, we're ready to get on with our lives. We want to have a meaningful relationship. Let's, let's cut the bullshit. And let's put it out there here. When we first met, we met for coffee. Coffee turned into lunch and I moved in with her a week later. Damn. Um, because I put my cards on the table. When I, when, when I had met her, we, I had just gotten out of a really, really bad relationship. I was both mentally and verbally abused. So for, for people out there who think, you know, guys can't be the, the abusee, I tell you, I, I took a lot that I shouldn't have because I thought I was strong. And I thought that this was, you know, how could, how could this happen to me? So when I, when I moved, so I was living in a different state and moved back to Rhode Island and met her pretty early on. So I was kind of like couch surfing. So when I met her, I was like, listen, um, this is, this is what's going on with my life. This is where I am. This is my situation. And at least on, on the face of things, it didn't look like she hesitated once. She was like, okay, come stay with me for a bit. That's now turned into an eight year marriage. And, wow. um, and still going very, very strong. Even, even if she's a very extroverted person, I am a very introverted person, regardless of how I sound. I'll go hang out. I'll hang out. I'll party. I'll close the place down. Don't talk to me for a week after. I, I, <laughs> I, my, my energy is spent. I get it. She will hang out in the house. We'll cuddle. We'll watch TV. We'll take the dog for a walk. And she's like, okay, I want to go out now. And, and <laughs> she will close three places down. And that's how she re-energizes. And I, I can't do that. <laughs> so, so the honest communication up front, lay it all out there, you know, no, no reason, you know, to, to try to be so slick. I've tried that. It, it doesn't work. You end up with, with the worst people, Yeah. Um, but also surrounding yourself with people who, who are open and who are honest and, and have an ability to communicate because if you don't, you just keep, again, you, that, that negative feedback loop, you just, you know, oh, well, we have to do this because so-and-so is doing this or, you know, nah, I don't got time for that. Yeah, I mean, your life is different than everybody else's life. Your relationship is different than everyone else's relationship. You don't need to keep up with the Joneses if you ain't a Jones. No, I have I have family that that, that look at at me and my wife and they're like, man, how do you guys do that? And I, I tell them the same thing. But I don't want anybody to be you know if they see us, I don't want them to be jealous of us. I want them to be like us, and and we're happy to tell you how we do it. But it may not work for you, but within you know the tips and tricks that we have, there's something for you. Amen to that. I love you'll it. figure it out. The only thing I'm going to ask if I can throw in, I would, I would get yelled at if I don't. So I mentioned earlier that we do record a, a podcast. It is for an organization known as SHIP, S-H-I-P. Uh, it was formerly called the Center for Sexual Pleasure and Health based here in Rhode Island. It's a 501c3 organization that deals with sexual education and wellness for adults. One of our taglines is the sex education you deserve. So they, they offer a number of webinars and uh, workshops to talk about sexual education and wellness. The podcast is relatively new. It's called Virgin Territory. We talk about everything from kink, polyamory, BDSM, and, and any of the workshops that do come up. It is, again, it's, it's hosted by my wife. Occasionally, I do pop in and co-host, which are some of the more fun ones, I think, instead of sitting here just like pressing buttons <laughs> on, my, on, my, on my soundboard for them. So it, that's, that's uh, mostly on Apple Podcasts, but it, it's elsewhere, a virgin territory. And the website where you can find everything is weknowship.org, S-H-I-P. I see the pun there. 
I got to Yeah. Well, we have a lot of, <laughs> we have a lot of ship and shit puns. <laughs> yes, indeed. You got to enunciate, right? Be like, you, you ship. have to. Yeah. I don't always get guests who do the plug before I get to do the plug in the after show part, but Josh took care of that for me. So thank you, Josh, for plugging your podcast. And uh, if you want to follow Josh, on social media you can do so he is on instagram at white heart josh uh it is white w-h-i-t-e underscore heart h-a-r-t underscore josh j-o-s-h on instagram and thank you josh for being so open and forthright about a variety of topics uh you still aren't getting a lot of people to speak openly about things like relationships and sexuality and uh Uh, cultural identification, which I think is a really important piece of this conversation. Uh, I haven't had very many conversations with people in the kink and BDSM community, and uh, I I very much appreciate your willingness to discuss all of these things. So uh, thank you, Josh, for your honesty, and thank you to all of my guests for their honesty. Thanks for listening to the Detoxicity Podcast. My name is Mike Joseph. Once again, if you want to find me online, hit me up on Instagram at Detox Pod Guy. I'm on Twitter intermittently at Tiz Mike Joseph. You can go to facebook.com slash detoxicity. You can email me detoxpod at gmail.com. Love to hear constructive criticism. Love to hear feedback. Would love if you are a potential guest or you know somebody who you think would be a potential guest, please, by all means, reach out to me. And remember, if you enjoy this podcast, subscribe, rate, comment, do all of the things necessary to push this podcast up in the podcast rankings and get this into as many ears as possible. Tell a friend, do whatever it is you need to do. And uh, thank you once again for listening. I personally want to thank the following people for their support. Uh, Calvin Williams and Jacob Block, Jeff Giles and Andrew Grossman. Thank you very much. I hope all of you stay well, stay safe and healthy. Until next time.